Hello, and welcome to Loyola Marymount University. My name is Dennis Draper, and I'm the Dean of the College of Business Administration. Each year, we are fortunate to bring in a number of prominent business executives and special guest speakers to participate in our CBA lecture series. From high-ranking government officials, to leading journalists, to internationally acclaimed social entrepreneurs, all of our distinguished speakers share one common goal, to educate our students and local community on some of the biggest issues in global business today, all while reinforcing LMU's underlying mission of teaching business with ethics and social responsibility. Thank you for watching, and I hope you enjoy the presentation. Uh, anyway, I'm Larry Calbers. I'm the uh, Archad Dreyer Chair in Accounting Ethics and the, ch and the Director of the Center for Accounting Ethics, Governance, and the Public Interest. So welcome tonight to our Distinguished Speaker Series. I want to thank Na Nancy Donovan and her students for her planning and logistics to get this uh, event going tonight. I want to thank Natalie Durdeck for her great work to publicize the event and the other work that she does. I want to recognize uh, Dennis Draper, our dean, who's encouraged and supported the work that we do. Dennis, where are you? OK. So last night, as I was thinking about tonight's presentation, I realized that our first speaker in this series was Cynthia Cooper, the WorldCom whistleblower. And she spoke on November 8, 2006, in this very room. So we've been doing this series for about 10 years, if I can do the math. So Lynn Turner is actually the first speaker in the series to be invited for an encore performance. Lynn is incredibly generous with his time and clearly loves talking with students. On this visit to LMU, he will have talked to students in nine different classes before he leaves tomorrow afternoon. He has also had some great conversations with faculty members, and I have thoroughly enjoyed a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with him. It's been really great. It would take some time to go through all of the positions that Lynn has held over the career, his career. I'm going to mention a few, but I want to talk more generally about him and the fact that he has seen accounting from many different points of view. He's been an auditor, a preparer, a regulator, a researcher, an investor, and a board member. My observation is that throughout his career, he's really had only one client, and that's the public. He is the epitome of an accounting professional. I think of him as the Diogenes of the accounting profession, the guy walking around with a lamp looking for an honest financial report. <laughs> He's perhaps best known uh, serving as the chief accountant of the Securities and Exchange Commission from 98 to 2001, but he also spent 20 years as an auditor at Coopers and Libran, which is now PricewaterhouseCoopers, and currently is a senior advisor to Hemming Morse, LLP's Forensic and Financial Consulting Services Group, and he's a member of the Board of Trustees and Audit Committee of the Colorado Public Employees Retirement Association, which holds over $48 billion in investments. I think that number is about right? Yep. Okay, right thank you. Uh, please give a warm welcome to Lynn Turner. <clears throat> Thank you for that kind introduction, Larry. Uh, it's good to be back. It's actually great to be back here. This is a great university in, I think, what it instills in its students, and you're all very fortunate to be here. I know they charge you for being here, but uh, <clears throat> notwithstanding that small aspect of the things, it is uh, a place where I think you're going to get an education that you're very proud of and serves you well uh, going into the future. And uh, I did. I got my degree and joined up exactly 40 years ago today with Pricewaterhouse uh, Coopers as a young auditor in their Lincoln, uh, Nebraska office. And I couldn't have found a better place to go to work, public accounting was and continues to be probably one of the best training grounds you could ever go into. 
It's probably one of the toughest, if not the toughest job to have in the business community uh, today because, <clears throat> in fact, you're supposed to be saying no when you should say no and yes when you should say yes, and that's not always an easy task, especially on the no side. But with that in mind, <clears throat> and I've spent time with a lot of you over the last couple of days, more in the morning, but I went, did want to talk about or asked, talked with Larry about talking about uh, the auditing profession and from the context of a profession that's been around since the 1890s, at least in the United States, well before that in the UK, but we've been around for a long time, but with the digital world and everything that's available to you on the website, <clears throat> there is a serious question being raised of what is the value of an audit today and what is the value of auditing to our society and to our capital markets. So I want to touch base on that, go over some statistics with you that are more than anything food for thought. What I really want to leave you with today is some information that allows you or hopefully provides you with more questions than answers, but makes you really think about what we do as a profession <clears throat> and are we doing really what we need to be uh, doing. And of course, as we all know, Congress for the first time in 1933 mandated that we have these audits, these independent audits, at least of the public companies. Up till then, it really wasn't required, but because so many people have been scammed during the Roaring Twenties and had lost their money, it had done so much damage to the country, Congress felt it important that we create independent audits. And initially, when the legislation was drafted, <clears throat> it was drafted to say, we're going to have federal auditors, we're going to have government auditors, not private sector auditors. And the accounting auditing firms went to Congress, lobbied to get that to change, Glad that's not mine. <coughs> and uh, uh, anyway, uh, the accounting profession was successful on getting Congress to change it and require that we have private sector auditors. But that change was approved by a vote of one in Congress. But for one change, change of one vote in Congress, the auditors doing this audit work today would be the auditors in a government agency, much like the banking auditors at federal banking regulatory authorities. And I think Congress made the right decision. The auditors at the federal banking authorities haven't always been done the best job, with Wells Fargo probably being exhibit A these days. <clears throat> But then we had another fiasco and blow up with the Enrons and WorldCom, cost a lot of people their jobs, seven trillion dollars in value in the capital markets and Congress said, okay, these private sector auditing firms can no longer police themselves, they don't do a good job, let's create a new federal government agency to oversee them and created the Public Oversight Board. <clears throat> and that's important that these people do do their job in the right way. And that's because they have a very, very special role in our society today. And the Supreme Court, in a legal decision, has laid out the role that you will have as auditors when you go to work out there, those of you who do that, what your role is. And it is a role that says you have to have complete, not some, not most, but complete fidelity to the public trust. Unquestionable. You are, in fact, a public watchdog. Unfortunately, in recent years, I have seen members of the big four auditing firms 
go into courtrooms and argue that they do not have an obligation to the public. And every time they have done that, the jury has rejected that. And when people, when the attorneys show to the jury what the Supreme Court has said their role has been, in every case, the jury has upheld that obligation of the auditors. And auditors are the only profession in the United States that is charged with this type of obligation and this type of responsibility. And so it is marvelous <clears throat> that those of us in the auditing profession are viewed that way by our society, are viewed that way by our government, but it's only fabulous if we honor and live up to that expectation. So what's an audit supposed to do for us? <clears throat> an audit, as everyone knows, gives you some assurance that those numbers are accurate. So where I sit on the board of a $48 billion fund and we invest money for over half a million dollar people, it's important to us that we have confidence that we can rely on those numbers when we decide which companies to turn around and invest in. We understand that the auditors don't test every transaction, so it can't be absolute certainty with those numbers. But it is, by definition, supposed to be a high. A high, not low, not medium, not pretty good, but a high level of uh, assurance. And that assurance is supposed to tell us whether or not that auditor has found errors regardless of whether it's just a simple error, negligence by, or error by negligence or if it's fraud. That's what your job is supposed to do, be, as you uphold this public watchdog fu function. Because you might have collusion, we acknowledge you won't find the errors all the time if you do a properly planned audit. Our problem is when we find errors time and time again, we find the audits were not properly done. There might have been collusion, but the audit in and of itself wasn't properly done. And if that's the case, that doesn't give the auditor any excuse or any out from not detecting the errors in the financial statements. That's consistently what the court has heard. And in cases like Madoff, Colonial Bank, the largest failed bank during the SNL crisis, Enron, Adelphia, and every one of those cases and many, many more, the auditors just never did the audit right. Was there collusion? Of course there was collusion in some of those. But at the end of the day, just because there's collusion doesn't it, uh, waive the obligation of the auditor to fulfill this public watchdog, do the audit right, and try to detect it. And when they don't detect it and have given a clean opinion on the financial statements, again, the most important appellate court in the United States out of New York has said, giving that opinion saying those numbers are correct when in fact they aren't can be like taking a chisel or a crowbar to the capital markets and do tremendous amount of damage. So I ask myself, in light of all that, so how are we doing as auditors in an auditing profession today? Question we should always ask. Investors should always be asking this question. There's over 110 million Americans with trillions of dollars invested in the capital market. It's a question that should be asked. <clears throat> in a survey, I guess that's not a clicker thing. <laughs> In a survey by a couple university professors not too long ago, and this is where they sent out a survey for CF to CFOs. <clears throat> this should probably get the attention of some of the CFOs in the room. They asked the CFOs about what they were doing to manage their numbers. 18% of companies 
manipulate their numbers by an average of 10%, that's a very material number, in any year for the reason cited. It goes undetected. So if 18% of the CFOs are willing to tell you they're doing this, it poses the question, how many are doing it but not telling you? Now leading up to the corporate scandals at Enron and WorldCom and all of a couple decades ago, there were two very similar studies, surveys of CFOs done. At that point in time, as we were heading into those scandals, and those scandals and fraud had already started, the two for surveys found a very similar, almost identical result, with one exception. The 18% was about 3% lower. So the instance of people cooking the books today actually appears higher than it was pre-Enron and Adelphia. Another two professors went out and in a study then noted that today, even though the auditors have to tell us whether or not the systems are good or not, whether there's internal control problems or not, what we're finding in most cases is the only time that the auditors tell us that there's a material weakness is after a company reports errors in the financial statements and after a restatement has occurred. But at that point in time, the horse is already out of the barn. And if I was still a CFO, I'd probably feel a little bit like they're in bayoneting the wounded or the dead and dying. You know, they don't say anything beforehand, they only say something after the problem. So that's clearly a problem. No problems when things are popping up at companies like Citigroup during the uh, financial crisis. We'll talk a little bit more about that later on. So how are we doing on the financials and the accuracy of the information that's going to these 110 million Americans as a result of these audits? So it was clear that after the enactment of SOX, <clears throat> people did a deep, deep dive and came in and look at, started looking at their numbers for the first time. The CEOs and CFOs had to certify it. And we went through a cleansing process, which resulted in the high level of restatements in that 2004, 2007 time period. And things then came back down Interestingly, as it comes back down, or at the point in time it also came back down, there was a change in the regime at the SEC, and the SEC adopted some guidance that gave more leniency to companies, so they didn't have to always report to the public that they had errors in their financial statements. And when that goes into effect, corresponds with when you see a drop. But notwithstanding that, we still see hundreds and hundreds of financial statements there with problems. In fact, over that time period, <clears throat> we see an error, a defect rate, 7, 6, 8, as high as 11%. But if you add up all those restatements year by year, and add up the average number of companies during that time period, you would say, and this is obviously rough math, but about three quarter of the financial statements issued there at some point in time had a restatement on an annual basis. Now, I was a VP and CFO at a major international semiconductor company, and we made semiconductor chips, and storage system solutions. We sold our chips to companies such as Hewlett Packard, uh, Western Digital, Seagate. Uh, they went to 
the companies that manufactured cell phones because they went into the cell phones and all. And if we'd had a product that had this type of defect rate and we were selling you cell phones with our chips in there, where 10% of them each year for 10 years were defective, how long do you think we would have been in business for? Probably not very long. Most people wouldn't view that as an acceptable error rate. We would have actually been out of business pretty quick because our customers like Wichita Digital Seagate would have fired us. <clears throat> Anytime we even had a small error rate, they were appropriately calling us up and calling us on the carpet. So, We've seen something about the error rate in the financial statements. We've seen something from management telling us how often they're able to manipulate the numbers and get away from it. So then let's actually look at the audits and look at some independent data on the audit. Each year the PCLB goes in and does an inspection of a small percentage of audits, less than 3%, 1 to 3% of the audits of public companies. That's all they look at each year. <clears throat> and they go in to see if the auditors have complied with generally accepted auditing standards. The rules they're supposed to follow, the independence rules, whether or not they really are independent. And over the last three years worth of inspections, we found over a third of the audits each year didn't comply with gas. Now in the audit report, the audit report tells us in black and white and language from the auditor that they have in fact conducted their audit and done all the steps they were required to do under these auditing standards in order to form their opinion. I recently saw an example of that in an audit, PCLB had inspected it, found it deficient. Major company, big four auditor. I was called because the PCLB had asked them to rectify it and the board wondered what to do about it because the auditors had told them how many hours they thought it was going to take to fix this audit where there was a defect in it. The audit, the attorney on the other end of the line told me the audit firm had told them the board that take 10,000, actually over 10,000 hours to fix the audit. Not do it, but to fix the audit. Absolutely incredible. At one point in time, they had 68 out auditors out in the field, on site at the company, fixing the audit. Not doing it, fixing it. So these aren't always just minor misses. 10,000 hours for you in business, about a $2 billion a year company, I could do the whole damn audit for 2,000 or 10,000 hours. So, and in fact, in that case, the PCLB had told the auditors they'd done the audit not by examining evidence, but by inquiry. So let's look at them. Delo Deloitte and Touche, probably the best error rate, but still over a quarter of the audits are defective. You know, you have to wonder when an industry sets a standard for itself and the audits are still over a quarter defective, what does that say? Ernst & Young? One out of every other audit? Keep in mind, two Ernst partners were recently sanctioned for having relationships with the management team. Maybe that contributed to this problem, I don't know. 
PwC, better than Ernst, but not as good as Deloitte. But look at that error rate. Again, if you were buying cell phones and Apple put you out a cell phone, that 30% of them didn't work, what would you say? You'd say you were buying a Samsung, not an Apple, you know? You just bought a Samsung 7. It doesn't work. I get on the airplane these days and I watch as people come on. I watch to see if they got an Apple or a Samsung. Because if they got a Samsung, I want to make sure that thing shut down. KPMG, look at that, over half, over half. So let's look at the next three, because people say, well, maybe we ought to give business to the next three. Look at that error rate, it goes up. Look at that Grant Thornton error rate. These guys bring it home. These guys win the contest. <laughs> you know? Yeah, Dean, these guys got a higher winning percentage than Southern Cal does. <laughs> so, Clearly, there's an issue going on with the quality of these audits. And this is, just, this is an independent review. So then, I asked yourself this question. I initially was talking at Ohio State University, and I had breakfast with the head of the accounting department. I think was chair of the American Accounting Association one year, and two partners from two of the big four firms in town, there in Columbus, Ohio. Office man two office managing partners, great guys, and the department chair who had worked for me, great guy, and we were having breakfast and we were talking about this issue. And they were talking, they thought they're audit quality was better than what perhaps the PCLB was leading people to believe. Although, quite frankly, if it takes 10,000 plus hours to fix an audit that the PCLB has looked at, I got, it takes you 68 people to do that, I, I'm sympathetic with the PCLB. But I asked them, given what they were saying, I said, <clears throat> well, let me think about this. Name me three major financial statement frauds where the audit, auditor was one, the first to find it, and two, the first to report it to the public. And I ask that you think back to that statement by the US Supreme Court. They are a public watchdog with a complete fiduciary obligation to the public. So given that, Name me, can anyone in the room name me three major financial frauds where the auditor has found them and was the first to report it to the public? So I asked the same question when I was given this lecture at the University of Wisconsin in a group like this, and I asked this question. And all of a sudden, in the back row up in the dark, I hear, Lynn, ask him to name just one. No, nope, should have been, because the auditors were aware of it, but the answer was no. This man is courageous, though. Let's give this guy a hand. He at least, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. You will do good as an auditor. So, no, Enron was not one of them. 
The guy in the back of the room at the University of Wisconsin turned out to be a guy by the name of Harry Markopoulos. Harry was the gentleman, the hedge fund investor, that wrote a letter to the SEC, a several page letter, dissecting exactly how the fraud at Bernie Madoff's firm was being conducted, in which the SEC filed and did absolutely nothing with. Harry couldn't remember a single one. I would hope there is at least one, I actually think uh, there might be one. But if that's the case, think about the, what the Supreme Court said. So I'm sitting as a trustee, again, on a $48 billion fund, we invest in 5,000 companies in the United States and around the globe. If you got that type of defect rate, you got the CFOs doing what they say they're doing, you got the problems with controls that you got going on, I've got a second follow-up question for you after this one. Why should we be spending shareholder money paying for these audits? Why would you pay for a Samsung 7? Why would you pay for these when this is the result you get? Honestly, believe about 70% of the people in America always do the right thing. I think 70% of the business community are extremely upstanding, will always do the right thing with those financial statements. And I, I would probably trust them if I knew who the 70% was. Minor detail, but uh, I don't think we need to spend the money on those audits. But since we don't know, we do spend the money, but since this is the result, they never tell us when there's a problem other than coming in and banetting the dead, why should we, as an investment fund, see shareholder value go out for that type of product? In fact, often, the auditors do know about it and just don't tell you about it. They knew about the problems at Enron. In fact, there was a memo that came out in the core filings where the executives all talked about the problems. There was a problem in a company, a large company called Waste Management, where the auditors in Ron wrote a memo again. The memo described how they knew the financial statements were materially misstated, over 10% in error. But the management team, which included a bunch of former Arthur Anderson people, absolutely didn't want to change the numbers. And so the memo described how they were going to cut a deal with the management team at Waste Management, in which they would agree to sign the opinion saying the financial statements were correct this year, provided management would sign the agreement and agree to fix them in the following year. And Anderson did that. When, during our investigation, we found that memo, I was astounded, as I think most people would be astounded by that. What was Anderson's response to that when we found it? They rewrote their policies. And what their new policy say? Shred those memos. So just a few months later, what popped up? Enron. And what'd they do with the memos? Shredded them was not probably the most advisable response to that problem. Probably not as bad as the CEO at Wells Fargo, but not a good one. <clears throat> and over years, I'll pass on this, over the years, uh, there's been a lot of settlements. There's actually been a lot of settlements that are bigger. Uh, certainly there were some bigger ones on some of these. But in each of those cases, in fact, let me tell you another one. Fannie Mae. Fannie Mae's a gr another great case. Everyone knows the government's funding them and bailing them out these days. Fannie Mae was audited by KPMG at the time. And the CEO of Fannie Mae was stepping down. 
and a new CEO was coming in place. The new CEO had come out of the White House. Both were extremely well connected. The retiring CEO would end up on the board at Goldman Sachs. But in order to pay out the bonuses the two CEOs wanted, for the retiring guy, it was his last one, and for the new guy, they had to make more money. And KPMG had a, I'd done a good job and identified an error in the financial statements. But if that error got recorded, they couldn't pay the bonuses out. So anyone know what they did? They booked half of the error. They booked it up to the amount of where the executives could get paid their bonuses, but not so much that they'd lose them. So when you got that fact pattern, auditor has to acknowledge they knew about the error, has to acknowledge that they only booked half, has to acknowledge that it had an impact on the bonuses. And you put those facts in front of a jury, what do you think the jury's gonna decide? Do you think the jury's gonna decide that it's investors picking on the audit firm? Ain't gonna happen. They're gonna be, see it as someone aiding and abetting in the fraud, which is what they did, and it cost the audit firm quite a chunk in that particular case. <clears throat> One of the problems is we still do audits the same day way we do to, uh, we still do audits today the same way we did when I came into the profession 40 years ago. Yes, we no longer use the Monroe calculators or adding machines. You know, we no longer use a number two pencil and uh, so that's good. We'll use a calculator, some of the computer digital technology we have. But for the most part, we still do an audit the same way. We have management give us the numbers, management gives us the trial balance, they give us the general ledger, they give us the supporting reconciliations, and then we ask for, and management gives us the evidence to support their numbers. What we don't do is go and ask for the evidence that may say, what, are the, what if the numbers are wrong? Is there any evidence out there that calls into question these numbers? And we've never done it. So we never have found the frauds. Other people have found the frauds, regulators, analysts, researchers. Heck, in the financial statements that Groupon used when that company went public about a half dozen years, it was two old grumpy college professors that found the error. My God, if two old grumpy college professors <laughs> out of Penn State nonetheless <laughs> could find that problem, don't you think the auditors on site in Chicago could have found it. Just asking, you know. It's amazing. All too often the relationship has gotten too cozy, which is why the European Union has jumped way ahead of us and is now requiring rotation of auditors. I was just talking to People, I think it was a BMW, a Mercedes Benz, they'll be, both be changing their auditors this year. Many of the big institutions in London made changes in their auditors last year. And with all these changes that have been going on, it's amazing that the world didn't come to an end as the CEOs of these big firms predicted would happen. Life has gone on. The firms have gone on and functioned. 
and we're actually getting better audit reports out of those countries. We'll look at one here before long. So just because you have to periodically change doesn't bring the world to an end. Another problem we have with audits <clears throat> is how we staff them. So one of the reasons that audit firms have said we shouldn't rotate is because we build up all this knowledge of the company over years and we shouldn't let that go to waste. And common sense tells you there's some validity value to that argument. But when you look at the audits, only 5% of the total hours that are put in on an audit typically are done by an audit partner. A very small percentage. So the person with all that knowledge base, very small percentage. The audit manager, about 15, 10, 15%. In one of those PCB inspection reports a couple years ago, by the way, they noted on a PC, PWC audit that the partner had only put in 1% of the total hours. <clears throat> so 80% of the hours are put in by these extremely talented, bright young people who don't have, quite frankly, a lot of business expertise. Great people. I was one of them, very bright, very talented, coming out of great universities like this one. But at a business, the business people live there day in, day out, 365 year, days around the year. They know that business. They know it inside and out, and they are extremely talented, very good business people. That is business expertise. It's not someone who comes in for two, four, six weeks a year and then leaves. And many of those people that put in the 80% of the hours stay at a big four firm for two to four years and they're gone. So the people who do have the expertise do know the business the most aren't putting in but one out of every five hours. We recently had a case I testified to down in Miami. Some of you know this, some of the, you have seen the trial transcripts. But in a complex derivative area involving securitization of loans, it was an intern assigned to audit it. So my national inclination was, oh, it's an intern, junior year, had intermediate accounting at least. But no, it was a sophomore that had had introductory accounting. <clears throat> As we mentioned in waste management, they found the problem, didn't say anything. Same thing in Enron in Adelphia. They actually found the problem of undisclosed related party financings that were off the balance sheet. The, the Deloitte team went to the management team, asked them to disclose it. The management refused to, and Deloitte went ahead and signed the financial statements and issued them with disaster effect, $10 billion in losses for the investors. Again, that chisel, that, that claw hammer to investors. So it isn't that they didn't know it's that they didn't say anything. It's that cozy relationship and that reluctance to be what the Supreme Court has said they're supposed to be, a public watchdog. As I've looked at these audits and dealt with audit committees, dealt with some of these cases, dealt with investigations, probably the number one problem that I find is the auditors just never understood the business. Just never understand what's going on in the business. And if you don't understand a business, how could you ever design an audit to ensure the numbers are accurate? Why would anyone think they'd be able to find a fraud if they didn't understand what was going on in the business? Had one situation, we were doing work for a trustee 
Midwestern company, oil and gas, midstream type company. If you looked at the financial statements, it said they were hedging, all their commodity trading was hedging of inventory. But all you had to do is look in the auditor's work papers and realize they had tons more in commodity contracts in terms of quantities than they had inventory on hand. The third, part, the outside party that they'd done all their contracts with for years had ceased doing business with them. They actually, this mid-sized company was doing more oil and gas trading than Exxon was. They had a very high percentage of the overall trading market in the US. Yet no one on the audit team ever asked them what was going on with the business. No one ever understood where the fraud was. And it turned out to be a fraud. Interesting, the audit firm's own specialist came in after everything blew up. These consulting experts that were supposed to be using on audits, they didn't use on the audit, but after it blew up, they had them come, come in. And in a day and a half, they issued a report that highlighted <coughs> all the things wrong at the company and why it was a fraud. They never thought to call them and have them come in during the course of the audit, even though that expertise resided in the firm. <coughs> um, lack of skepticism. We're supposed to be skeptical, those auditors. On Lehman, there was actually a whistleblower. And the whistleblower teed up an issue. Ernst Young was aware of the whistleblower. But the Ernst Young audit partner, who had agreed to interview the whistleblower, sent out an email shortly before he went to interview the whistleblower. And in the email, God, how attorneys love these emails. In this email, the Ernst Young partner sends an email to another partner and says, I'm going to go interview the whistleblower, but nothing's going to come of this, so don't worry about it. Why would you ever say that before you even talk to the person? Didn't even know the person. It's a true lack of skepticism, which is required by the professional standards. I can't tell you how many times I've seen an audit that is really well planned and says, here's all we got to do, and it's great. And then you get down to the end of the audit, and they haven't done some of the key parts. You see that time and time again, the PCLB is seen. <clears throat> the standards require us to have persuasive evidence. I can't tell you how many times persuasive evidence turns out to be a rep letter signed by management and nothing else. And the standards specifically say in black and white, that's not acceptable. In the colonial case, again, the largest failed bank in the United States had to be taken over by the FDIC as a result of the subprime crisis. 50,000 transactions where the fraud was done. Grand total of 4.2 billion in contracts over that point in time, by the end of 2008, was reported on the balance sheet as a number, a separate line item, all by itself on the balance sheet is a little over $1.5 billion. Partner never read the completed contracts for those. And there were several completed contracts for each deal. Never acknowledged, acknowledged you hadn't read the contracts. If you don't read the contracts, you're probably going to have a tough time understanding what they say and knowing how to audit them. In that particular case, the U.S. trustee came in and got appointed by the federal court. He sees the 1.5, figures out, I, uh, 
I better figure out what's going on with the 1.5. Makes a 15, he told me he made a 15 minute phone call to the other party on the other side of the contract. Ask the contract in a 15 minute phone call how many of those transactions they'd done with the bank and an outfit involved with them and the outside third party who supposedly had bought the 50,000 contracts said zero. So you've got auditors auditing number, can't find an error, the magnitude of $1.5 billion. The trustee can make a 15 minute phone call on and figure out. Now, how much should we be paying for that audit? How much would you pay for that audit? I'd pay for the 15 minute phone call. Some of the other problems that we've seen time and time again time and budget pressures. One that was amazing to me was back in 2007, 2008, I was appointed by the Secretary of the Treasury to a special commission to study the auditing firms. And we had several days of hearings. We had one or two days of hearings here on the Southern Cal campus. We had business executives, auditors, business people from around the globe. One of the things we asked about was how are you measuring audit quality? And every one of the firms came in and told us, you can't require that we measure audit quality because none of us know what those audit qualities indicators are. All the CEOs of each of the big four firm also told us that none of them prepared gap basis financial statements which was another issue. If you guys are supposed to be so good at this and you can't even do it yourself, what does that say? But if you can't measure something, you can't manage it. You can only manage what you measure, but no one measures audit quality. The PCLB has tried to do a standard requiring disclosure of audit quality indicators. And to a T, each of the audit firms have come back and said, oh, we don't know what the audit quality indicators are you'd use. Yeah, we could use this or that. That's part of our problem. Quite frankly, that's why they've got those error rates in their audits. You know, why should anyone be surprised if you aren't measuring and managing audit quality? You know, that's what you'd expect to get. Shouldn't be surprising. The other thing is we talked about, they don't tell us about the problems. Here's the audit report of Citigroup had something like 800 million in off-balance sheet SPs going up into the subprime crisis. I don't see that we see anything talking about that in that audit report just before the crisis. Here's the next one. Nope. Not mentioned there either. Citigroup isn't getting in trouble. Remember this is about the time their CEO was asked about the crisis and why they keep making the bad mortgage loans. And they said, as long as the music's playing, you gotta keep dancing, you know? But no mention of the dancing that was going on or the risk to those of us in the public. This is a company that took a huge bailout by the taxpayers. 2009, the damage has been done, bailed out. CEO replaced, company's on its knees. Oh, same audit report, no indication of problems. So if I get that type of reporting from this public watchdog that's supposed to have a complete fiduciary obligation to me, doesn't ever tell me about the problems, just the same old report each year, what's the value of that audit? What should I pay for that? There's kind of a theme here to my questions, but you know, what should I be paying for that? Now, here's the report on a large international insurance company. Here's the US report. Okay, so let's see what we're doing around the rest of the globe. So here's our audit report 
in the US. And for those of you who have taken auditing in the business world, pretty much a standard report. I've done my audit, the financial statements are correct, audited internal controls, we test to provide reasonable assurance, standard boilerplate language, talks about internal controls and all it isn't, nothing new in that. So here's the US version of that. Now let me show you, so what, a page and a half here? So let me show you what investors in the Netherlands get on this same company. US standards versus European standards. And remember in Europe, they're already requiring rotation, which we haven't done here. They actually require a lot in Europe that we don't have here. They're way ahead of us. So here's the Netherlands report. It says, right up front, here's what our opinion is. <clears throat> actually give a true and fair view of the company. So it really reflects what's going on at the company. Here's the financial statements. Now it starts talking about their audit opinion, and how we did the audit. They tell you what a material number is. We don't disclose that in the US. Auditors don't tell us how they figure out what's a big enough number for an adjustment or not, but these guys have. A little bit more in detail. They also talk about how some things, even though they may not rise to that magnitude of a number may even be material, even though they're not that big. Tell you about what they're testing. Tell you what risks are. Tell you who the work was done by. If work was done by other auditors, who reviewed it tell you what each of the key audit areas are. These are the things that keep in the audit partner awake at night. These are the key, th key things that are very important at the company. In the United States, these things are documented by the auditors in a completion memo at the end of each audit, but they never tell us about it like they're required to do in Europe. So in Europe, the auditors turn around and tell us each of the key and big ticket items. And since these are filed here in the US, it isn't a different litigation because they could be sued here in the US for disclosing this as much as likely as they are in, in Europe. But they're still giving it to us in the US. Not only that, then for each key audit matter, they turn around and tell us exactly how they got comfortable with that during the course of their audit. Every single one of the key audit matters. Finally finish up with some statements about their responsibility. So let's see, one, Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Pages of very useful information that they have provided to investors. So if you got your choice, would you pay for that report? or would you pay for that report? What would you pay for that report? What would you pay as an investor for that report? David Tweedy, Sir David, who was the chairman of the International Accounting Standards Board, the Accounting Standards Board in the UK, was the lead partner for KPMG in the UK before he did all those things. 
wonderful man. The queen has knighted him, so it is Sir David. He came and gave testimony on his opinion and audit report in the United States, which is what's the quote above. It's hopeless. What's the value of a hopeless report? What would you pay for a hopeless report? So what do I think has to change? And I do think the system has to change. I don't think it'll change anytime soon. We've got a great pattern in this industry. We go and about every 15, 20 years, we have a major scandal and blow up. And when that happens, there's new legislation and new regulation. It's, the accounting profession has never been proactive in changing. They'll only change when they're forced to change. It happens time and time again. It's been going on for the last 100 years. It'll go on for the next 100 years. It's just the way the animal acts. And so we won't see any real changes but as we're already seeing in the data and in the numbers, there's a problem out there that's festering and growing. <clears throat> so some point in time down the road, next decade, decade and a half or so, maybe two decades, we'll have another blow up. And when that happens, Congress will jump back in and the SEC will jump back in, PCLB, and they'll do more regulation. And I think we may actually have a fundamental change in the uh, profession at that point in time. The real change is the auditing firms need to change who they think the customer is. It really isn't management who they view it as. It is the public. We've got to start using better tools. We've got to start using the tools that Wall Street uses to analyze these companies and find these frauds. They've got tremendous databases. You're starting to hear out the firms about big data and the use of big data. Unfortunately, I had this conversation with each of the big four about a dozen years ago about their need to use the data and the models that can go with it. It'd be marvelous in helping out with the audits, but they'd never gotten there, and I've yet to see a single audit where you got into the audit work papers that actually did in-depth analysis of the companies that quality that would, uh, really of any quality, that would find these type of uh, problems. <clears throat> we actually need to change that business model instead of being like a triad, triangle, with all those young people at the bottom. We need to turn it into a more of a model like the legal profession with a lot of uh, paraprofessionals doing a lot of the basic work that will stay around for a number of years. And some very well trained new hires each year out of the universities, but we need people who are going to stay and be able to get the business expertise and will be able to communicate with the controllers and the CFOs as paraprofessionals and stop this up or out type notion where most of the people leave in the first four years. Uh, <clears throat> because the numbers are so wrong, it's almost impossible today to do active asset management and outperform the markets. We just aren't getting the quality and the accuracy and the data so we can make those type of active management investments. So one of the implications I think you'll see is a continued migration of the public to index funds, which is probably not good for the capital markets in general, because I think it actually has a negative impact on the accuracy of the pricing of stocks. I think it uh, prices it wrong sometimes. Um, but it does raise the question of whether 20 years from now people are going to want to pay for these audits. So what would I change the system? I'd get rid of the law that says the 1933 and 34 Security Act. I'd change the language in it that says you have to have an independent audit to language that turns around and say the owners of the company, the stockholders, every five years will vote and decide whether or not to have an audit. If they vote to have an audit, fine. If they vote not to have an audit, fine. 
but it'll make it very clear that the auditors work for investors and not for management. And 99.9% .9 of the time, investors are gonna vote for it anyway, but it changes who you're really working for. Then you'll have the shareholders approve who the auditors are each year so that the auditors know that if they screw up and aggravate the auditors, cost them, or investors and cost them money, they're probably gonna get thrown out. Uh, <clears throat> we'd have to give them data on audit quality, so we've got to start measuring audit quality and providing that data to the public. For example, if you're the investor in a company where it takes auditor 10,000 hours to fix the audit, that'd be information I'd like to know as an investor, <laughs> certainly before I vote on the audit firm next year. <clears throat> uh, I'd have the audit committee negotiate the audit fee, pick the auditor, are subject to approval of the shareholders, and then have the audit committee submit the bill for the audit to the PCOB. They collect the funds and the PCOB would pay the audit fee. It would no longer be the management team doing that. And the PCOB already has the collection mechanism in place to do exactly that. It doesn't take a new system. The system already exists to turn around and do that. Um, and if the PCOB does one of these inspections and goes in and finds that it have been done so poorly that it takes 10,000 hours to fix it, they would have the right to require that the company change and move to a new auditor. They'd have, auditors would have to look to public available information I've been trying to tell the auditors, we got a wonderful th new thing out there these days that the auditors could use to do this. It's called the internet. You can actually do that these days. This is how Wall Street finds the frauds. I ran a venture-backed financial research firm. We actually found and reported more frauds to the SEC and to the firms themselves than they ever found. The audit report would be more in line with what they're doing over in the Netherlands. We, we need to think about what the Europeans are doing. I'd change your education. You really do need sufficient knowledge and expertise to do some of this work and you're thrust into that role early on in your career. So I would up the requirement. I absolutely think you need to have, at a minimum, a master's. 150 hours, I know the firms tell you all sometimes, just come on out and join us. We'll give you a paycheck. And that paycheck, since you've been a poor student paying gazoos for tuition for four or five years, been so painful it's just enticing to go get that paycheck and buy your new little red truck. But I gotta tell you, they had extra six months in school or whatever it takes to finish the master will be worth every single dime to you in the long run and will yield you tremendous returns if you just hang in to it for a little bit longer. Think long term. Uh, You know, at the end of the day, we need to understand we do these financial statements for one and one reason only. It's not for management. As a CFO, I could get whatever information I wanted whenever I wanted it in whatever format I wanted it. We had a great s database and system. So you don't do the financial statements for management. That shouldn't establish the accounting standards. We do this for those people who have put their hard-earned savings to work in the capital markets and provided that money to create plants, do R&D, create jobs for you. They're the customer and they're the ones willing to put out the money and we need to make sure we get them what they need to continue to make those investments. A few other things. Yeah. 
we need to do with something with the corporate board at Wells Fargo, I will tell you that. All righty. That's it. I think we're done. <clears> Thank <throat> you.